This is Style of Substance. Cannibal Holocaust. One of the most disturbing films of all time, and one of the most requested videos for me to cover on this channel. Where should I even begin? Hmm. Ah, I know. Salo, or The 120 Days of Sodom, was released in 1975, shortly after the murder of director Pier Paolo Pasolini. The film was relentless in its disturbing and provocative subject matter, all at the service of a communist critique of the commodification of human bodies, especially the bodies of the Italian youth, not solely at the hands of the fascist in World War II, but throughout history, now manifesting in the form of pornography. Salo may not be the only film to take viewers to such extremes, but in my opinion, it's the one to truly succeed the most as proper political commentary expressed through sincere shock value. Whether influenced directly by Salo or not, many provocative filmmakers would like to think of themselves as following in the footsteps of Pasolini. Oftentimes they aim to make the next big shocking picture, the next Salo, to varying degrees of success. But in the process, these people tend to lose sight of what actually makes Salo work as a political statement. Such provocateurs take refuge in sensationalism for sensationalism's sake. With mere image comes a communicated message, style of substance and all that. But that's not to say that preaching a message must be at the forefront of a film. But with a lot of these films, sensationalism comes first, and the idea of a message is used as a safety net to rationalize, sometimes insecurely rationalize, its purpose of sensationalism. You will find with many of these films a blurring between the lines of what the true modus operandi of the artist is, and what they present it to be. Now, I am drawn to the visceral and to the extreme. I do like many of these films, but I also think we should be honest as to what we are watching, why it was made the way that it was, and what we as viewers are actually getting out of the deal. Roger Diodato's 1980 film Cannibal Holocaust, more or less, confronts these very questions, and exists as a political paradox, an exploitative exercise, and a metatextual critique of cinema's place within the so-called civilized society. But with all that said, I will argue that Cannibal Holocaust is yet another attempt to shock, and to provoke, to push boundaries and top solo. But the thing is, I don't think you can top solo. The title, Cannibal Holocaust, invites comparison to the Shoah, with such carelessness and flippancy, its transgression for the sake of transgression, constructing images that are meant to be taken just as, if not more disturbing, than those of the concentration camps. This is, in my opinion, an immoral intention. Yet, for better or for worse, there is a cultural investment in such an ugly idea a taboo interest to not only produce such material, but also profit from it. Likewise, there is an interest on part of the audience to consume such material, to pay for it. Sensationalism is cyclical. That said, I do not think of myself as a moralist when it comes to art, but treatment of the Holocaust, as we call it, is where lines start being drawn for me. This so-called documentary footage is offensive, it is dishonest, and above all, it is inhuman. But at the same time, the comparison is appropriate insofar as what the film is seemingly intending to do and say. While the vast majority of Cannibal Holocaust is in English, it is ultimately an Italian production, and thus reflects Italian sensibilities towards history, including the fascism that cannibalized the nation, leading up to and throughout the course of the Second World War. Italian fascism wasn't initially in favor of the Nazism that arose in Germany, but as the years went on, fascist Italy became a close political ally to Nazi Germany, and anti-Semitism quickly spread throughout Italy. The concentration camps throughout Europe were instrumental in genocide. 
the fascists, both on a collective and individual level, were ostensibly made into monsters. The camps served as sadistic sandboxes for the fascists to play and carry out their power. Sadism is an understudied point of focus in Schindler's List. Steven Spielberg's film demonstrates the otherwise bright futures of the German youth, completely destroyed and replaced with false fulfillment by promises of national exceptionalism, and the right to carry out their sadistic urges, buried within the human heart, onto the other. <laughs> Salo also explores such ideas. The fascist libertines round up the Italian youth, strip them of their humanity, and subject them to psychological, sexual, and physical torture, all for their own sadistic pleasure. Tutto è buono quando è eccessivo. And save for the briefest buried signs of hope, the fascists win. They get away with it. Just like the Nazis. Siete fuori dai confini di ogni legalità. Nessuno sulla terra sa che voi siete qui. Per tutto quanto riguarda il mondo, voi siete già morti. This appropriation and deconstruction of the Marquis de Sade story is meant to be analogous to the fascism that engulfed Europe and nearly brought an end to the Jewish people. In Republic, Plato says that he who wears the ring of Gyges and makes himself invisible to the gods and authority figures is now free to carry out his internalized desire to do wrong. Socrates argues possessing such a ring enslaves a man to evil, and a man cannot be happy with such a power and freedom from consequence. In turn, they are corrupted by the ring. Cannibal Holocaust investigates this idea, but with questionable results. The film is divided into two clear halves. The first half sees Professor of Anthropology Harold Monroe leading a rescue mission in the Amazon rainforest to find a group of young filmmakers who went missing and, well, died, while making a documentary on uncontacted indigenous cannibal tribes. The second half is where we see the documentary unfold, recontextualizing the entire picture and the expected innocence of the filmmakers. Here it is made apparent that these filmmakers are very much like the fascists. By abandoning their original social environment and leaving behind the laws and previously held cultural norms, they feel not only compelled to give into their sadistic colonialist urges, but also encouraged. These young adults wear the Ring of Gyges. But what is the ring, though? In this case, it is the camera. In the world of the film, director Alan Yates, his girlfriend the script girl, Faye Daniels, and two cameramen, Jack Anders and Mark Tommaso, set out into the Amazon to make their film The Green Inferno. No, not that Green Inferno. Alan's previous documentary, The Last Road to Hell, displays many of his sadistic tendencies. He prides his art for its supposed gritty realism. But said gritty realism is a sham, orchestrated by exploitative intervention. There's no actual message or conscious political idea informing Alan's artistic choices. It's all pornographic coverage of atrocity, with passive political propaganda only being an afterthought. Well, just to give you an idea how Alan and the others worked, everything you just saw was a put on. You mean this was That was no enemy army approaching. Alan paid those soldiers to do a bit of acting for him. While making the Green Inferno, Alan gives in even further into his most sadistic tendencies. With the Amazon rainforest serving as their playground, here Alan and his crew are allowed to be savage, just as the Yanamamo and the Shamatari are seen as savages. Though these filmmakers are far, far worse, but anything goes. To make matters even more disturbing, it is the camera that initially protects these documentarians. It is the camera that also continues to corrupt them. 
Alan continuously puts others into harm's way, whether it be the animals that occupy the rainforest, the tribe he does unspeakable things to, or even his own crew. He is sure to let things linger, so that they are clearly captured on film. He stages attacks on one tribe as if it were a battle between two savage groups, when it is he who burns down the homes with the tribal members inside. He also rapes and kills a tribal woman, as if she weren't a real person, as if she were just a prop. The connection to pornography here is obvious. Jack, what do you want to use it for? A porno film, stupid man! That's not a bad idea. How about jungle jollies? <laughs> hey, you want me to keep shooting? They impale her and make it look like it were the tribe. Many conclude it was the tribe who did it, but no, I don't believe Alan for a second. They did this to her, and if by chance it actually wasn't direct, which I would attest it was, they still put her in that position. We see it all on Alan's face. In reality, the acting is good here, but Carl Gabriel York plays a bad actor. Watch it, Alan, I'm shooting. Oh, good lord. It's, it's unbelievable, it's, it's horrible. I can't understand the reason for such cruelty. Alan feigns disbelief during his moment of violent exploitation. Yet there's a hint at this moment of ambivalence, that somewhere deep down, Alan knows what he did was wrong. He is just so far gone, and sadism overcomes him, just as it overcame the fascist during World War II. And in the end, Alan reaps what he sows. He sought out to make the most shocking documentary ever, and he did just that. But what's most shocking isn't what he reveals about the cannibal tribes, but instead what he reveals about civilized society. Forget it. There's no electricity where we're going. Nope. This is anything but a well-organized safari with all the comforts. Weapons. Camera. Medicinal supplies. That's about it. The camera also functions as a colonialist weapon. Alan and the others serve as representatives of the so-called civilized Western order. And like the colonialists of the past, they cling to the fallacious notion that their way of being is not only objectively better than those of the indigenous people, but they also possess rights over them in their home. Their actions are metaphorical representations of colonialism. And more specifically, what is often white colonialism. We have succeeded in establishing, shall we say, diplomatic relations with the Yukumas, but what are we for them? These are people who have never seen a white man before, or heard the sound of a gun. We know they are really afraid of our powers, but for how long? Just like the guns and knives used to maintain control, the camera serves a similar purpose. To the tribes within the film, such technology is unheard of. Film itself is thought of as a foreign dark magic. The making of this documentary is a curse upon the natives. Well, the Yamamomos understood how important these film cans were to Alan Yates and his crew. They thought the silver boxes contained their power. A power which I must say again, caused much damage and violence. In some ways, such an assessment is right. Within the process of constructing the sensationalist simulacrum that is the Green Inferno, documentation itself acts as a powerful threat and an incentive for evil. Paradoxically, both what is shown and what is not shown is of equal importance. Much of the Grand Inferno is meant to be lost within the context of the film, but what remains is edited down, leaving the most disturbing minutes on the cutting room floor. But even Alan did not plan for everything shot to be made into the film. He just used the filmmaking process as a means to carry out colonialist chaos and ethnographic exploitation. The tribal people are reduced to playthings, their home, their language, their culture, all desecrated. They are rendered mere instruments, 
to construct and reinforce a narrative that pits tribes against each other in violent and savage ways. Whatever would be most exciting and titillating for audience members. I mean, what's exceptional about a primitive tribe like the Yakumo being terrorized and forced into doing something they don't, they don't normally do? Come on now, Professor. Let's be realistic. Who knows anything about the Yakumo civilization? This demonizes the tribes, all while promoting the clearly misplaced assumption of superiority of civilization, the propagation of the myth of the modernized man. Regardless of Diodato's intentions behind Cannibal Holocaust, the film is blunt with its messaging. From the very opening shots, the Amazon treetops are compared to the skyscrapers of the urban landscape. The film encourages us to ask what civilized even means, if it means anything at all. The film explores how, through media and through film, the so-called uncivilized world is raped by the so-called civilized world. Plenty of critics have made these comparisons. Likewise, they have also called BS on Diodato, stating that he is no better, that the means of production of Cannibal Holocaust quite clearly contribute to the exploitation that he inadvertently paints himself as intending to critique. You see, Diodato claims he didn't actually have much political drive behind the film, that he just wanted to make a film about cannibals. But the film also speaks for itself, and against itself. It was conceptualized by Diodato in response to the media sensationalism of the Red Brigade's terrorism on Italian television, and he also took inspiration from the Mondo film documentaries. This comes through in the final film, and if Diodato was truly not sincerely trying to say anything, he may just be a bad filmmaker because Cannibal Holocaust clearly communicates specific messages regardless. In the film, Professor Monroe protests the release of The Green Inferno claiming that the footage is so shocking and so unethical that it is better off destroyed. The station wants to release it for this very reason. We are talking about the most sensational documentary to come along in years. What, and you want us just to shelve it, to forget about it, as if it had never been found? Is that what you want? Yes. Yes. That is precisely what I want. Today, people want sensationalism. The more you rape their senses, the happier they are. Ah, uh, yes, that's typical Western thought. Civilized, isn't it? That's what Alan thought, and that's why he's dead. It isn't until they see the entirety of the footage that they have a change of heart. John, I want this material burned. All of it. I take Professor Monroe as acting as the relative voice of reason for audiences, to provide moral exposition of not only the film within the film, but also the film itself. In addition to the footage being mistaken for an actual snuff film and leading to his temporary arrest, Diodato was accused of abuse and sadism by members of his cast and crew. There were many arguments about unfair payment, and Diodato pressured his lead actress to strip naked for a sex scene that she was reluctant to do. There was plenty of discomfort on set, especially during the scenes of sexual assault and real-world animal abuse. Oh, we'll get to that, don't worry. The indigenous people within the film are also, ironically enough, subjected to exploitative practices by Diodato. While he may not technically be as bad as Alan, Diodato sure is a lot closer to him than one would like to admit. Diodato ultimately relishes in the sensationalist spectacle, in the exploitative means to capture it. <laughs> The main theme composed by Riz Ordolini is, in my opinion, pointlessly great. Far too great for this film. It is, from what I can tell, purely non-diegetic in application within the film, meaning that its accompanying select scenes are to complement the film, rather than the in-world Green Inferno. This song serves to manipulate our emotions, all while insisting on relative profundity and sadness. But at the end of the day, it's still unearned. But maybe that's the point. 
but it's still unearned. Why did you come to consider Rizzo Ortolani for the music for Cannibal Holocaust? I know it's very dramatic and sad. Uh, was this intended for the very violent scenes in the movie? I like it very much, the, the joint, the dramatic scene with the sad music. I like very much for that. The tribe being pushed into their house, only for it to be set on fire, it's not beautiful in the slightest. It's ugly. But the devious music evokes a sense of post-moral catharsis, all the same. But this is not sincere in the end. It is still sensationalist. So then the day when I got to the set and Ruggiero said, okay, now in this scene, you're gonna sweep through the village and you come over here and you shoot the pig. And the point of this scene is that, you know, we were dominating this primitive culture and, uh, and that Alan Yates would stop at nothing to get, um, to get a shot. Things like this happen all the time in the jungle. It's survival of the fittest. In, in the jungle, it's the daily violence of the strong overcoming the weak! Jack! Even if Diodato only takes passive interest in critiquing exploitation and sensationalism, the tactics he employs in this critique are undeniably contributing to this very brand of exploitation and sensationalism, rendering the text's messages hollow and paradoxical, yet also making for a fascinating case study. Essentially, Cannibal Holocaust cannibalizes itself. The film constructs a paradox, and arguably a thematically important one. In order to truly prove that the civilized man is, for all intents and purposes, just as savage as the elusive boogeyman other, Diodato and his team cannot be absolved from that criticism. This is the excuse for exploitation. And I said, um, so when you say shoot the pig, do you mean um, that we, I actually, I mean, is this live ammunition? And he said, of course. And I said, well, I, I don't see any point in that. Uh, well, we can just pretend and then, because this is the movies. You know, I'm just not the kind of guy to go shoot a pig who hasn't done anything to me. So, um, so I said, no, I won't do that. And Ruggiero, without missing a beat, said, Luca, in this scene, you sweep through the village, you shoot the pig. Throughout the course of Cannibal Holocaust, real animals are slaughtered for the camera. It's not so much the few instances where indigenous people kill animals for food that bothers me, but rather it's what this is contrasted with. It's the haphazard, careless treatment and slaughter inflicted by the civilized man onto the animals for the sake of the film alone that gets to me. I, I said, are, are you actually going to kill this monkey on camera? And he said, yeah. And I said, but this is the movies. You don't have to do that. And he said, yeah, right, but we're in the Amazon. It was one of those things that you couldn't quite not look at. Even though a monkey is much closer related to humans than a turtle is, the monkey's decapitation by the tribe while still incredibly shocking and unpleasant to see documented through the voyeuristic eye of the camera, it is not nearly as disgusting or pornographic as witnessing the turtle getting dragged out of the water and its body cut apart and cut open until rendered nothing more than a bloody shell that once housed a living creature. And both within the film and the film within the film, this is all done for the camera. It's both a sadistic and masochistic game meant to be shared between filmmaker and audience. This is not because it is ostensibly animal abuse for art or entertainment, but also because the role of animal abuse is a paradoxical one. On one hand, it is completely hypocritical and antithetical to the messages of the film. Diodato isn't practicing what he is preaching. He is committing exploitation of abuse with the camera, destroying the bodies of animals for the sake of sensationalism. If it were actually a meaningful critique of exploitation, Diodato wouldn't be doing just that, killing animals for art. Like, he demolishes that turtle. It's meant to be shocking. But, on the other hand, 
He is exploiting abuse to reinforce his message, and it is upsetting by design. The idea behind Cannibal Holocaust is to call into question what makes someone civilized or uncivilized. By abusing animals, he is proving his point. The civilized man seeks to exploit and to abuse, and this is expressed with Diodato exploiting and abusing. But this would be like, I don't know, beating your wife to a bloody pulp to make a point that domestic abuse is bad? Do you see, honey? Aren't men awful? It undermines the very savagery the film critiques, while being reinforced by people indulging in it solely for the film alone. It is morally repugnant, it is upsetting, it is edgy, it is tedious, it is offensive, and it doesn't exactly work with the argument it presents, despite simultaneously complimenting it. For whatever it's worth, though, Diodato has expressed regret about his treatment of animals. I guess that's worth noting. Furthermore, the animals weren't executed solely for the camera, as they did serve as food for the crew, but they were still executed for the camera, a camera that lingers on all of the graphic details. That's when I uh, pretty much knew exactly what I was into. Except what I didn't know at that point was whether or not they were going to do that to us. (laughs) In other words, I didn't know if this was a snuff movie or not. Diodato is not a whole lot better than the kids directing the Green Inferno, and I do think he is trying to say that too. I just failed to see why this paradoxical framework is necessary. I don't think it is. But it does work. Because it doesn't. At the same time, there is an argument to be made that many horror films are built upon a foundation that is inherently reactionary and taboo. There's an expression of honest but objectionable views that are internalized about the other. The first step at reconciling these socially ingrained prejudices and repressed dark compulsions to gain power. Such films and their underlying politics can be hypocritical in practice. For example, in order for Mihal Haneke's Funny Games films to work, although arguably they don't, to effectively support the director's moralistic perspective on viewers' relationship to on-screen violence, the films must also commit to being a heightened example of precisely what he's critiquing. There has to be a bet. I mean, what do you think? You think they stand a chance? You're on their side, aren't you? Haneke invites his audiences to introspect on their liking for on-screen violence, but in the process, he arguably constructs an even bleaker picture, a new class of sensationalist entertainment that satisfies his guilty sadistic urges, while also rationalizing them. Sondern ich wollte eben auch mit dem Genre des Thrillers ja mehr als den Thriller oder überhaupt mehr als einen einzelnen Thriller treffen, sondern das Genre Kino als solches, das mit Gewalt handelt. But even in his most indulgent moralism, Hanukkah suggests an understanding that people are seduced by violence, including himself. Why don't you just kill us? You shouldn't forget the importance of entertainment. Within the fictional world of a film, a director like Hanukkah has free reign to explore and evaluate his darkest impulses. But Diodato brings real-world abuse into the picture for the sake of the picture. He is not the only one to do this, of course, but he crosses the line while pointing out that line while moralizing his own actions. Professor Monroe utters the iconically ham-fisted closing line to the film. I wonder who the real cannibals are. By this point, it is clear that the savage image of the uncontested tribes the first half of the film presents the viewer with is severely recontextualized. We are meant to see the modernized man as just as, if not more savage, than the cannibals. The cannibals kill the filmmaking crew as an act of self-defense and an act of vengeance for the dead. It's an eye-for-eye retaliation, so their woman falls victim to rape and murder as well. The film acts as if it shows the invading West as the real cannibals here. Since we see them burning down homes, hurting, raping, and killing the poor indigenous people, but we also see this as twofold. 
The film climaxes with the Green Inferno's final shots, and it is here that the real cannibals, as Diodato likely sees them, are revealed, and the final question is rendered superfluous. The natives emerge like wild animals from the jungle to gang rape and decapitate the white woman, to destroy her body with the most extreme of force. The camera, both diegetically and non-diegetically, communicates the following message. Regardless of the motive, the true cannibals to society is the other, for the other is an inherent threat to those who leave behind civilized society. The film assumes the other is savage. It just wants to point out that the civilized are savage as well. The Akumo Indian is a primitive, and he has to be respected as such. You know, did you ever think of the Yakumo point of view, that we might be the ones who were savages? <laughs> well, I never thought of it that way, but it's an interesting idea. Yes. Destroying the footage once and for all reads as if an attempt to stop the cyclical nature of sensationalism. And doing away with the Green Inferno is framed as, more or less, a moral good. The thing is, while it is commendable that the footage did not circulate as entertainment, Destroying the footage altogether is an act of censorship, in favor of preserving the values and integrity of Western civilization. This is destroying the proof of their evil, their complicity. It is a noble lie to uphold a false image of civility. The Nazis tried covering up the Holocaust. They nearly succeeded too. But photographs and archive footage remained. Some feel as though these images of the concentration camps should have been destroyed, that such evil should not exist in the medium of film. But what's done is done. Moving forward, what we should do is take it seriously and learn from it. Thanks for watching. Hey everybody, thanks for making it to the end of this video. Uh, I, this one has been on my agenda for some time now, and I'm glad I finally was able to, like, release it for you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed what I had to say. Uh, let me know what you thought in the comments below. And please like, subscribe, uh, share my work around. It really helps with my channel. Um, and if you would like to do even more, uh, check out my Patreon. Uh, you'll be able to access uh, my videos early, as well as uh, gain access to exclusive content whenever I <laughs> put some stuff on there. Um, yeah. So, uh, special thanks to these patrons, uh, on the screen right now. Claire, Greg, Werner Saz, Yakar Janoy, Adam Young, Devin O, Isaac Kangas, Leah Kimmela, Sophie Pilbeam, Picadon, and Wolfgang. Thank you so much for your continuous support on this channel. Uh, bye. Oh, good lord. It's... It's unbelievable. It's... It's horrible. You know, I'm just not the kind of guy to go shoot a pig who hasn't done anything to me. One of my very favorite movies ever, uh, 